All right, so where were we? Let's go look. So there's a new video I want y'all to watch called Data Structures. Crash Course, video 14, watch data structures. Go ahead and do that one. Same one as, same place as the other one. Good video, pretty short, right? It's only 10 minutes long. We'll be talking about data structures, so it's a good thing. Come on, open up. All right, so we got through page 42 on chapter six. It almost sounds like we were done with it. Let's go look. Nope, there's still some more left. All right. Functions returning a value. We know how to do that, right? I'm going to stop using the online compiler and go ahead and use Visual Studio. So we are on lecture LM. Console app, of course. Lecture M. All right. So we know how to define something that returns a value, right? Int add takes two variables and returns a result. So then I can do int, you know, r is equal to add three comma four. And then if I printed r out, r would be seven at that point. I'm gonna get rid of that. I really would like for y'all to go ahead and get rid of this as well, right? Don't need that stuff at the bottom. Don't really need saying this file contains the main function. So instead, I'm just going to make it have a comment that we're in chapter six, page 46 to, I'll update that with however far we get, right? Okay, guess we're in 47 anyway. So we can return a value. They called their function sum, I called it add, it does the same thing. So the prototype and the definition must indicate the data type of the return value. If you are returning a value, if you're not returning a value, you'd write it as being void. And then the calling function should use the return value. I mean, yeah, you could ignore it, but if I did this, add three comma four, it wouldn't do anything, right? It's like telling you to go bake me a cake, but I don't do anything with it, right? Because the result is not stored anywhere. So why did I do it? You know, so I need to use it somehow. I need to either store it in something and do something with it, or I could just display the results, right? I could see out, you know, the result of that, like that, that would work. I need to add my using namespace, E and D up here. What am I doing? Using namespace STD. I don't know where I got that END. I think I was thinking, looking at that. All right. And so this would print out seven, right? Because it calls that function, gets a seven back from it when the return statement returns, then it uh, and sends that to C out. And if I wanted to put my functions below main, which looks kind of nice to have main up at the top, then I could cut and paste that and I would have to create a prototype for it, either here or in a header file. So I'm just gonna copy it and put the prototype up here. The prototype is just a function definition without a body and then a semicolon there. So now we're good to go. So returning a Boolean value. Yeah, sure, you can return a Boolean value as well as anything else, right? We could write a function called bool 
less than zero, right? And it takes a number. Heck, we can make it flexible and take a double, right? Double D, whatever. And if D is less than zero, return true. Otherwise, return false. Now, we could rewrite this as one line of code. We could just say return D less than zero. Now, maybe that looks a little too, too terse. You could do bool result is equal to D less than zero and then return the result if that made you like it better. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. And that way you could set a breakpoint on it and figure out what the result was before it was returned. So that's not a bad way of doing it at, at all. But anyways, so now we could check to see, you know, we could figure out something int x is equal to negative nine. And if less than zero parentheses x, then we could display a message, right? See out, yes, x is less than nine. So you can pretty much return data of any kind of data, right? Not just ints. You, Characters, strings, bools, floats, doubles, whatever. Your own data types, if you want. You could uh, define your own data types and return those. So what would that look like? We're gonna have a structure and we're gonna call it triangle. And a triangle has a height and it has a width, right? So it's gonna have two values, double height, comma, width. And we're gonna make a function that makes a triangle. And so it's going to return a triangle. We're gonna call it new triangle. And let's make it accept a height and a width, which I'm just gonna call H and W, easier to type. And so it's going to make a new triangle, triangle star PT, because it's a pointer to a triangle, equals new triangle, and then set PT arrow greater than height equal to the H, and PT arrow greater than width equal to W, like that, right? And then we could return the triangle, return PT. So down in main, I can make a triangle. I'm gonna cut this and move it to right above main so that there's no distance between it and the main function. Right, so I can make a new triangle. Triangle PT star PT1 comma star PT2. I'm gonna make two triangles. PT1 equals new, excuse me, new underscore triangle with a height of 10 and a width of 10 and PT2 is equal to new triangle with a height of 20 and a width of 20. And then we could do something with it. I don't know what. We could write a function called get area and the area of a triangle is its height times its width divided by two. So let's write a function that's gonna return a double and it's gonna be called area of triangle and it's going to take a triangle as, so triangle star PT, a pointer to a triangle, excuse me, triangle is supposed to be uppercase T to match our class, excuse me, our structure. And then so the area is equal to the PT dash greater than height times PT dash greater than width divided by two and then return the area, right? So we're just passing in a pointer to my triangle now, since this thing doesn't change the value of the triangle, I could even declare it as being const. 
I just think I'm not going to bother doing that. Okay, so, you know, double A1 for area one is equal to area underscore of underscore triangle passing in PT1, passing in our new triangle that we did there. And then double A2 is equal to area underscore of underscore triangle PT2. Right? We could do something with those values. I don't know what, right? Area one equals A1 NDL. I'm going to copy and paste that and change the ones to twos. Like there we go, right? Now we should stick triangle into its own header file probably and we could stick these other functions into a file called triangle.cpp. I think I'm going to leave it alone. You have the concept of that, right? I think I'm going to leave that alone. All right, so if we run it, it would print out the area of the two triangles. 10 times 10 is 100 divided by 2 is 50. So the first A1 would be 50. 20 times 20 is 400 divided by 2 is 200. So A2 is going to be 200. All right, and as predicted, area 1 is 50, area 2 is 200. All right, so that's using a data structure. We've created a data structure and we've started passing that data structure in to some functions so that we could deal with them, right? So that we could get the area of the triangle. And we're returning a data structure here so that we could make a new data structure. Now there's another way of grouping code because notice that we have defined our structure here and then we define some methods that use that structure down here. You can also create what's known as a class. And a class is a data structure that has functions embedded in it. And those functions are called methods. Let's add that to our notes up here. A class is a data struct, sure with methods at, excuse me, functions added to it. Those functions are then called methods. So let's do the same thing, except let's create a class called square, and it's going to have get area built into it, because here we had a new triangle and an area of triangle, those functions were contained outside of the triangle structure. I'm going to cut this and paste it so that it's right there. To make things easier to read, I'm going to move this function down below the code, less than zero. So I just cut it, added a semicolon, pasted it. So now we have two functions below main and some up above main, right? And so now we have two prototypes up here. Anyways, let's define a class called square. So the struct keyword creates a data structure. Typically, a data structure contains data, not methods, parentheses, functions, and all the data is public. That's usually what a structure is. How about a class? The class keyword creates a class. A class typically contains data, which are variables, private data. And methods, which you usually make public. Now the data doesn't have to be private, the data can be turned public. 
in which case it acts just like a structure, right? We were able to access height and width just by saying P1 arrow greater than height and P1 arrow greater than or dash greater than width, right? We can do the same thing. Let's make a class. We're going to call it square. And a square also has a height and a width. So double height comma width. Now we're going to write a function, but I need to call the methods that creates a new triangle. Excuse me, it's a square. But I want it to be accessible to the outside world. If I don't add the word public, then this method would not be accessible down in domain. So it's gonna be public. It's going to return a square. And it's going to take two parameters, h and width. So double h and double w. And it sets the height, this object's height equal to h, and this object's width equal to w, right? So that's just like our new function. This is what's known as a constructor. Constructor. A constructor initializes data in the object. What is an object? An object is an example of a class. It's a so-called instance of a class. Your class might be a recipe, then the cake is your object. If you have a blueprint for a house, the class is your blueprint and the house is the object that's made from it. Okay, so this is pretty much the same thing as our new triangle function was. And now we're gonna call one called get area or make one called get area. Get area is going to return a double. And so we need to calculate the result. The result is equal to this thing's height times this thing's width. And then we need to return that result. All right, so now down here inside main, I can create two squares, right? Square star PS1 comma star PS2. PS1 equals new square. And this is gonna be a 10 by 10 square. PS2 is equal to new square 20 by 20. Now let's get the areas out, right? A1 is equal to area, excuse me, PS1 hyphen greater than get underscore area. A2 is equal to PS2 hyphen greater than get area. Right. And so this is area one or triangle area one, right? And then triangle area two. But now that I've gotten the squares, I can print those out as well, right? So let's do that. Let's copy and paste those and change them to say squares. And so we see here how to create. I'm gonna cut this stuff and move it closer above the square creation code. So it's right underneath the creation of the triangles, just like that, right? We create two triangles. We declare our pointers to the triangles. We create two new triangles and then we get their area and we print them out. Here we create two squares. First we declare them, right? That's our declaration. Here's where we create them. This is also technically known as instantiation, making an instance. So PS1 and PS2 are pointers to square objects. 
and then we call ps1.get area and ps2.get area. So a key difference is that since get area has been made a member of the square class, you call it by using the variable followed by the arrow here, followed by the name of the function. Whereas up here, in order to get the area of the triangle, we had to write a function that accepted a pointer to the triangle, like that, right? So instead of saying PT1 arrow, arrow you know, hyphen greater than area of triangle, we have area of triangle parentheses PT1, right? And then the reverse down here, because get area is a method is a function defined inside the square class. And when you call a function that's inside a class, you use the arrow indicator if this is a pointer, otherwise you use a dot if it's not a pointer. Because you could make one of these and it, like square SQ1. SQ1 is an object, but we don't have a pointer to it. And this is going to complain that we don't have a constructor for it. No default constructor. So let's see if we can create a constructor that is 30 by 30 there, right? There. So now we've made another square, but we don't have a pointer to it. So SQ1 is a square. So if you're going to call it, right, double A3 is equal to SQ1 dot, not arrow, get underscore area. OK. So is there any reason to define via pointers rather than defining via an object just like that? Nah, I can't tell you that there is or not. And one thing you have to remember though is if you use pointers and you create new objects, you have to delete them when you're done. So now that we're done with our square, our pointers to our squares and our pointers to our objects, we can delete them, right? Delete PT1, because that's our triangle. Delete PT2, that's our second triangle pointer. Delete PS1, because that's a pointer to our square. Delete PS2, but we do not do delete SQ. I think that that would crash it because SQ is not a pointer. This is an error, can't do this because SQ1 is a square, not a pointer to a square. And what does delete do? Delete releases the memory of the object pointed to by the pointer specified. So you always need to delete your pointers when you're done using them. But if you create an object like this without a pointer, without putting an asterisk there, right? Because what's the difference? Here's how we declared it, right? With an asterisk and then we used the new keyword. All right, so we're, that's actually in a future chapter, but it's so important that I thought it was worth talking about now. Let's go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint so we can finish this chapter for today. Returning a Boolean value, a function can return true or false. Its function prototype and header is bool, right? And here's their example of one. They have a function called isEven, and it returns a bool. And so what does the is even function look like? Like this, bool is even and it takes a number. 
and it's got a Boolean value called status. And if the number modulus two is equal to zero, the status is true, right? Because you divide it by two, you got no remainder. So the number is even if there is no remainder. But if there was a remainder, then the status is false and it returns the status. And so then the code up above it called is even, right? And then did a, re a response based on its return value. So if we go here, they did a C out, please enter an integer, and then they did a CIN, and then they did if is even, parentheses val, then print out the number is even, otherwise print out that the number is odd. Local and global variables. A global variable is one that's declared outside of any function. So all of these are local variables, right? Local variables are variables that are defined inside functions or methods. The global variables are defined outside of all functions. So for example, we might want to create a global variable called pi, right? So double, and heck, we could make it a const, right? Const double pi is equal to 3.14159. Good enough, right? And then we can use this inside any function. Now we don't need pi anywhere, right? We did not create a circle class. Would not take long to create a circle class, right? And so let's give it a radius. Let's create a constructor that'll accept a radius. So we're gonna use a public keyword to note that the constructor can be called from outside the code. It can be called in main. So circle and it's going to take a variable that represents a radius. So the parameter to the constructor, notice that a constructor does not have a return type. Every other function has a return type, even if it's just void, but a constructor does not. We, we could give a little bit more explanation. A constructor is a method with the same name as the class that returns a pointer to an object of that class, it should initialize class, or excuse me, yeah, it should initialize member variables. And that's what this one's gonna do, right? It's going to set this object's radius equal to R. Now let's write a get area. So double get underscore area. It doesn't take any parameters because it uses the radius that's already defined here, right? And the area of a circle is pi r squared. I'm gonna go and get my boilerplate. just so that I know I have the POW function available to me because I've imported CMath. All right. And so double the area. Area is equal to pi r squared. So pi, which I defined up here, right? Of course I could use m underscore pi now that I've included use math defines, but I went to the trouble of defining my constant. So why not use it? right? Not very precise, but it's there. Pi times POW, this hyphen greater than radius comma two, right? And then we could return that area. And then main could create a circle just like it did anything else, right? 
down here inside main, I want to make a new circle. Circle C1 parentheses circle with a radius of 10. And then C out less than less than area of circle C1 is less than less than C1 dot get underscore area. Less than less than ENDL, right? Come on, don't pause. There you go. And let's create a one by pointer as well. Circle star PC2, a pointer to circle two is equal to new circle, parentheses 10. I'm just gonna copy this and paste this and change it a little, right? And so the, Urkel, the area of circle star PC2 is PC2 arrow greater than get area, right? Because this is a pointer to an object, right? It points to the uh, to the object's memory. It's not actually the object. And now that we're done with it, we better delete that circle. Delete C2, right? Unless we're going to do something else with it, right? Better not delete it and then try to use it. One thing you can do is if you're paranoid, as soon as you delete something, set it equal to null, and then the compiler will absolutely crash if it tries to use that thing again, right? So like PS1 equals null, PS2 is equal to null. It's not liking that. It's null in caps. Yeah, in this language, it's caps. My mistake. Oh, come on. like that. Now the reason you do that is so that if you then try to use it, like we say PT2 hyphen greater than get height equals three, like that, or PS1 dash greater than get underscore area, it'll crash immediately because that object has been deleted. And you want things to crash immediately if they access invalid memory, right? And so it did generate an exception. Let's stop our debugging now by pressing the red square. Now we're good to go. I'll just add a comment. Not a bad idea to set pointers to null after their objects have been deleted. Make absolutely sure that no code afterwards tries to use that pointer. Because otherwise it's still pointing to an area of memory and that area in memory might even have some data in it left over, right? It might still have the triangle that we created. It might still have that, but you're not guaranteed it, right? Because you told C++ that that object is gone right and so it can be reused that memory can be reused for something else and it's only a miracle if it actually happens to have any valid data at that point and so by setting them equal to null then we're we're kind of closing the doors on it right not only have we deleted it but we reset its pointer to null so that nothing is it can access it at all So a global variable is declared at file scope, meaning it's outside of any functions. Local variables cannot be accessed inside of other functions, right? If I have a variable in less than zero called result, I'm not gonna be able to access it in here, right? I can't say result is equal to false because this is undefined because it's local to that one. Local variable
can't do this because the result variable is local to another function. Hope that makes sense. Local variable lifetime. A local variable's lifetime, it exists from where the variable is declared to the end of the curly brace within which it was declared, right? So this variable gets created here, and then when it gets to this closed curly brace, because of the return statement, it no longer exists. If you create a variable inside curly braces like this, like string message, message equals this message right here, right? X is less than nine, right? Like that, and then we print out that message. This variable only exists from here down to here. Now that's different from Python to where if you create a variable while you're indented, it still exists even when you get to the unindented part of the code. But that's not true in most languages, especially these languages where you use braces to mark off your code, like this in Java. So if we try to print out the message here, we can't. It's gonna be a syntax error. Error, message is local to that if statement block up above. So it is not avail it is not available. It is not in scope here. So any global that you create should be a global constant. That's just a rule of thumb. You should try to avoid using global variables. That's just some advice. They make programs difficult to debug. And if you try to bring the project into a larger, a different code set, right? You've written a cool graphics library and now you wanna use that graphics library with a different game. Um, if there are global variables in it, it can make it a nightmare to implement. So here they've declared three global constants, pay rate, base hours, and overtime multiplier, right? And then they've written one of those programs that calculates your salary based on, you know, your pay rate and how many hours you've worked. And if you've worked more than that many hours, you get some overtime. So they declared these as constants. They declared them as global so that they could be used inside any function in this code, right? So they didn't separate it up like that, but they could have. They could have written a function called get pay. and then another function called get tax or whatever, and they could use those constants within those functions. Static local variables. Now this is a weird concept. You know how local variables lose their value when they hit that closing curly brace, right? They're erased. A static variable doesn't. So I'm gonna write a function called example of static, right? And it creates a variable static int x equals one. And then it sees out x, right? And then it adds one to x. Now, if this wasn't static, if we called it several times in a row, right? Example static, we called it, you know, 10 times in a row, three times in a row. I'm just gonna do a little copy paste rather than write it as a loop, right? It's gonna print out one, one, one. Let's do a system pause just so that we don't do the rest of the program here. Remember that it only works on Windows. I found a way to do it on others, but I don't remember what it was now and it would have been max specific. All right, so let's go ahead and run it. Right, and it printed out one, 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 which makes sense. The variable's created, 
And no matter what value we set it to, as soon as we return out of it, as soon as we hit that closed curly brace, the variable is destroyed. Now, if we declare this as static, it means don't destroy it when it hits that closed curly brace. It's still not accessible, right? I still couldn't try to access it here, right? I can't say x is equal to 10 here because it's still local only to this code, but it maintains its value. So now it's going to print one, and the next time it comes in, since x will have been increased, it's going to print two. And then it's going to increment x up by one, and so x equals three, so the third time we call it, it's gonna print out three. So we're gonna see it print one, two, three. Right, one, two, three. So let's go and add comment about that. Come on, go away. Yeah. Static local variables do not lose their value when the function exits. They are initialized only once, and after that, maintain their value. Just like we did here. The first time that function is called, that one that's called example static or whatever, the first time we call that function, it's initialized with one, but every subsequent time we call it, it's already been created. It's still created. It hasn't been deleted, so it doesn't get reinitialized. So it maintains its own va old value. So the static variable x is not destroyed when the function returns. So it is still there with its current value the next time the function is called. So the initialization of the variable only happens once. So static local variables retain their contents between function calls. They're initialized only the first time the function is called. Or if you don't initialize it at all, it's just set to zero. My example is just as good as theirs, so I'm gonna scroll past their examples. Default arguments. Default argument is when you give a value for the parameter, so that you can give it an argument when you call it, but you don't have to. Let's write a function that accepts a default value. We're gonna call it sum, and it's gonna take several variables, int x1, int x2, int x3, int x4. Now we're going to make it require two values but we're gonna make these variables option by giving them default values, right? Whoops, that was supposed to be a zero. And so our return value is equal to x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4. And then, wait, that was supposed to be the word int. And then we can return that. Right, And so down in main, if we want, we can say int AA is equal to the sum of one comma two, int AB is equal to the sum of one comma two comma three, and int AC is equal to sum one comma two comma three comma four. Right. So let's set a breakpoint here. Let's go ahead and run it. And we'll see that the first time it's called, x1 is equal to one. I know that you can't see that tiny print here, but x1 is equal to one. x2 is equal to two. 
x3 is equal to zero because we did not provide it with a value, right? So it, ex it takes its default value. And then x4 is equal to zero for the same reason. We did not give it a default value. All right, let's let it continue. The second time we call it right here, we provide values for x1, x2, and x3, but we don't provide a value for x4. So x4 is going to have its default value of zero. If I move my mouse over it, x4 is equal to zero, whereas x1 and x2 and x3 have the values that we passed in. The third time we call it, if we continue it again, we have provided values for all four parameters. We have provided four arguments. So all four of these are going to have valid values because none of them were initialized, were left zero. None of the default values were used. And so that's another way of making code without using overloads. I know we already talked about overloads. Overloads are when you provide multiple methods with the same name, like we could write one called product, and it took the value of x1 and x2 and returned the results, right? Return x1 times x2. And then we could write another version of it, right? Int x1 comma, int x2 comma, int x3. That returned all three of those multiplied together. Let's uh, just stop this so that we get more of our code editor back on the screen, right? x1 times x2 times x3, right? And so on. This is an overload because an overload is when you have two functions with the same name but differing parameters. And so now we could do, you know, AA is equal to the product of two and three, which would be six, and AB is equal to the product of two comma three comma four. But we could have written this with default values, right? We could have declared something that had, you know, a whole bunch of variables, and then we would not have to keep overloading it. Because if we were going to do this via overloading and we wanted it to to support add, uh, multiplying up to 10 numbers, we'd have to provide 10 overloads, right? The original plus nine more. Whereas we could just write one that had int x1, x2, x3, all the way out to x10, and we could just set each one equal to zero, like we did up here. Matter of fact, there wouldn't be anything wrong with even initializing all of them to zero, but then you could call it with no parameters, no arguments, and it would be zero which is weird, right? Um, you call a sum function, but you don't give it any data. That would be weird, but it would work, right? So let's add a comment. The default values of zero are used if the calling code does not provide arguments to fill them. So A is equal to sum, that would be equal to zero right? A is equal to sum of one, that would just equal one, right? Because we passed in one value, the rest would be zero. A is equal to sum one comma two, that would equal three, right? X three and X four would remain zero, right? Not zerp, zero. Here X two, X three, and X four would remain zero. Here, all of the arguments would remain zero because we did not specify any of them. X1, X2, X3, and X4 all remain zero because there are no arguments. So that's, let's put an equal sign there and an equal sign there and an equal sign there to indicate what they returned. All right. So that's just a reminder of what overloading is. Let's go ahead and click, get rid of that breakpoint. All righty, it's about time to take a break. So why don't we plan on getting back here? Right now my thing says 817. Let's plan on hooking back up together at 825. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording and I will be back in a moment.